the first time I hopped into a frozen lake, you know, it, it was a, a, a mental blocker in my mind. And you do these things and this veil of illusion of fear is gone. Welcome to the Zero Quit Podcast, where I bring you candid conversations with elite athletes, entrepreneurs, specialists, and other creatives. I'm your host, Brock Covington, and through these dialogues, you will hear powerful stories and practical advice that will help you live a more active and intentional life. If you enjoy the show, be sure to subscribe and share it with a friend. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Zero Quit Podcast. Today, I have on Austin Nicholas. He is a father, husband, outdoorsman, and content creator based out of Castle Rock, Colorado. Through his content, he shares lessons of self-sufficiency, survival skills, general well-being, and a whole lot more. And we just wrapped up a great run today. And on top of that, ate a great burger. Yeah, a fantastic burger. Very messy. I had to uh, <laughs> get used to the whole skirt idea. Yeah, yeah. But uh, once I etched it out it was it's like it's like a the appetizer is like the extra cheese the skirt of cheese around the burger and yeah. then you get to the the actual meat and potatoes of it um but we're, we're doing like an after hours episode at this point is what i call it because of a uh, stupid daylight savings time but we're uh we're making do got you in uh in studio as i'm calling it so i'm looking forward to chatting and hearing uh more about what you got going on sweet thanks so much for having me yeah dude so one thing that we talked about in our three different runs where we've gotten together, shared a long run, you got to know each other, is you, you had an interesting and a bit of a rambunctious uh, upbringing. So could you kind of briefly describe that youth and, and how what trajectory you were on uh, if you kept at that same lifestyle and attitude? Yeah, absolutely. So I was born in London, England in 1991 to a Danish mother and a Texan father. <laughs> My father was an expat over there and um, they were living in England. And we moved back and forth between Atlanta, Georgia and England a few times. We finally settled in Atlanta after the millennium. Mm -hmm. And I think as a result of that, I developed this mentality that because I was going to be rooted up from whatever stability I had, it didn't really make sense to develop long-term relationships mm, or, yeah. you know, uh, develop structure in my life. Develop and so, any roots. Yeah, yeah. So I turned to rebellion to uh, get my jollies off. And that evolved into a lot of drug use, a lot of uh, just pranks and, and you know, general property damage mm -hmm. and, and and things that ended up getting me into a lot of trouble. And my parents didn't really know what to do about it. And so I remember one summer we were going up to the mountains. My mom had driven me up there. It was the summer before my freshman year. And she drove me up to this cabin. These guys took me into this back room and told me to take off my pants and do monkey squats so that they could find out if I had drugs or not. Mm. Then took me to the uh, hospital to get blood drawn and then ended up dropping me off in the woods for two months with nine other boys learning how to bow drill fires, hiking 16 miles a day, learning how to forage, and ultimately culminating into a one-week solo where... I spent a lot of time singing sublime songs to myself and really diving deep into the human psyche to figure out who I was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that at that point, it was kind of like this, this realization point where all things came to a head and I didn't have anything that I could identify with, like my car, my clothes, my music, my Xbox, things mm -hmm. that you know, a lot of times kids find their identity in and it ends up making them uh, forget who they are, right? And I still didn't get it. I still, you know, I, I got sent to boarding school mm -hmm. uh, eight weeks into that program. I went from the cabin to uh, the airport. I ate a steak. I threw up the steak. I flew to Utah for a year and came back, went to school, still got into trouble. Yeah. And, you know, I just, I didn't, I didn't seem to get it, but it planted this seed inside of me that now today is the foundation of everything that I'm passionate about being the outdoors, being self-discipline, being, uh, this just mindset of, 
continuing further into figuring out who I am and finding that peace and solace in the woods. So you, you were this recalcitrant youth. Did you have a re- sense of resentment when your parents basically like kidnapped you and kind of dropped you off at <laughs> essentially like fat camp, but it, instead of, you know, for being overweight, it's this, you know, wild, rebellious youth. Did you have this frustration and did you feel like you wanted to uh, kind of act out after leaving that camp? Because you said that it didn't kind of course correct you initially. Yeah, I mean, I think that as human beings, when bad things happen to us, many times we turn outwards and try and lash out at the people that have done those things to us. But as I've gotten older, I've realized that my parents were just doing what they thought to be best, right? Yeah. There there are generational lessons that are passed down and they may not be right. They may they may be wrong, mm-hmm. right? But I think that my parents loved me and they were just doing what they could to set me on the right path, whether that be a wilderness camp or ultimately culminating in an evangelistic military lockdown (laughs) facility for my senior year of high school, right? I don't have any grudges held against them today because all of the lessons that I learned along the way, whether they were painful or not, ultimately made me who I am. Yeah. And I'm grateful for that. I think it's tricky, uh, especially, you know, you as your parent or as a parent, as your daughter gets older, like how do you steer them and, you know, away from drugs or away from, let's say, negative behavior without uh, anticipating that or igniting that uh, pushback that sends them even further into that direction, you know. Um, you talk about how you moved a lot in your youth and uh, I spoke to one guy in the past that had that a lot as well. And I think it serves maybe some personalities because it, it can be very freeing, but then it's frustrating for others. Um, what what kind of lessons or takeaways did you have from those experiences? And maybe how did you handle that as a you know growing adolescent? Yeah, I mean, look, it was really hard when you're a kid, all you want to do is find belonging, right? Mm -hmm. You want to make friends that last a lifetime. You want to develop this sense of predictability in your life by having that structure and having things be the same. And Mm -hmm. for a lot of kids that move around a lot, whether their parents are in the army or in international finance like mine was, it's it's frustrating when you can't put down those roots. But in retrospect, I'm really grateful for all of those experiences that I had and all of the variety that I have because <clears throat> now I'm able to relate to people from all different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. And in an ever-globalizing world, that's a huge asset. So I can go to France and hang out with somebody that I went to school in Denmark with, or I can go to a wedding in Italy of the best friend that I had when I was in school in England Mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever. So it's, it's something that I definitely learned to navigate, but now I, I see it as a blessing because I have, I've throughout the course of my life been exposed to a variety of different cultures yeah and a lot of kids in america they never leave their hometown right and so all they know is their friends you know that Mm -hmm. they grew up with and many times they all have similar mindsets and in this world today as we all know with the advent of social media and more travel Mm -hmm. and more immigration than ever before i think it's very important to have that Um, that mindset of continuous growth and continuous acceptance of a variety of different cultures, religions, or worldviews. Yeah, I think that's something that if you can't get through travel, you can at least attempt to do, at least how I try and attempt to do it, is, you know, listening to different uh, cultures or individuals, whether it be on podcasts or YouTube documentaries, et cetera, and also reading, um, you know, both... the past and history because you can see how these cultures developed, what they value because their value systems are very different than what we have in America. Um, you know, like the family unit and let's say a small country like, you know, Namibia and Africa or Thailand um, where, or yeah, the, especially these South uh, Asian countries where, yeah, their whole 
family will live in at the same household. And mm-hmm. you see them, you know, I, I had a lot of different uh, Indian households where I grew up in uh, suburbia back in Virginia. And you'd see like whole whole uh, households and whole families basically in the same household is what I'm getting at. And uh, instead of looking at us as, as, you know, an oddity or mocking it as maybe some kids do don't have that broader perspective, looking at it as a learning lesson or just a different way of life, not a better or worse way of life, but just different. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing that I want to turn to that's been integral for you, I think more not just the past few years, but over the past decade or so, is your love for the outdoors and how you've kind of involved yourself more and more in the space of hunting, fishing, um, eventually more more homesteading type activities. Was there a particular experience that ignited that passion for the outdoors or was it a slow trickle effect? So I've been obsessed with the outdoors since I can remember. When I was a kid, I used to build waddle and daub huts in the backyard Uh, I subscribed to a now defunct magazine called North American Hunting Magazine, and Mm -hmm. I would uh, send for samples. They'd send me, you know, different hunting samples like knives and, you know, things that I could try out. And my dad took me on a few duck hunts. One of the duck hunts my dad took me on because my dad didn't know too much about hunting. And I'd love to tell the story, but uh (laughs) We were in a muddy blind, you know, like a pit blind, and I accidentally got some mud stuck in the barrel, and my dad didn't know any better and said, go ahead and blow it out on the next shot. And so (laughs) on the next shot, up in the air, the barrel blows backwards like a cartoon, could have taken my eyes out, shrapnel could have, you know, cut a jugular vein. And so we didn't go on many hunts after that, (laughs) needless to say. So no Elmer Fudd. (laughs) Yeah. So I had been, I graduated from university and I was over in Thailand Mm -hmm. and I was traveling with a buddy for three and a half weeks. At the end of that trip, I decided I'm not going back. I didn't have many obligations. I didn't have a job lined up and I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I know, I knew that I did not want to get into politics, which is what I studied. I was just jaded on it. And so I worked as a teacher there. I ended up spending two and a half years in Thailand. And then my girlfriend and I at the time decided that we wanted to go to Australia. So we went to Australia, we parted ways amicably, and I walked, I think, uh, 50 miles from Cairns to a town called Bingle Bay. And I got a job working in this hostel or uh, yeah, in, in a hostel mm-hmm. folding laundry, and it was serendipitous. But on the way, on the way, walking back from the grocery store, because I used to walk everywhere, didn't have a car or anything. Uh, I met these guys called the Slush Puppies, and we ended up becoming great friends. They took me in as the the dumbass Texan, mm-hmm. and we started spear fishing a lot. I mean, I would get off of work. I was I ended up working at a, a resort as a bartender and we would just go out and the, the more Brit- I hear you talk from past conversations and this one, I swear you've lived like 30 lives in like 30 years on this earth or something. Yeah, it. I, it's been, a, it's been an incredible ride. <laughs> yeah. And shout out to the slush puppies. These guys are incredible. And, and so I really got into spearfishing there. Um, I got opportunities to go and try and hunt wallabies mm-hmm. and, Ended up going to India, uh, or ended up going from Australia to Nepal, hiked the Annapurna circuit with one of the slush puppies, Cookie, a close friend of mine. And then I, uh, I realized that I had a tax return hit and I had, uh, some more money. And so Cookie went back to Australia and I went to India by myself and I went all across India. I did a silent 10 day meditation called Vipassana that was absolutely life changing. And I realized at one point it was like, I need to get home and develop some stability in my life. I can't just do this the rest of my life. And, and not that it's a bad thing, but ended up coming home, met a girl. We, uh, fell in love and had a kid and one does. Yeah. As one (laughs) does. And I, uh, I one night was bartending and I always used to keep a resume under the register 
and this guy came in and they were and or a couple of guys came in they were in suits they were talking about healthcare technology and i ran them up a $500 tab and said who do i give my resume to they called me 3 weeks later and said you need to come out to colorado if you want to work with us so i convinced my pregnant wife to to come out to mm-hmm. colorado and we moved out here and she had a friend from high school that was out here uh, his name was Tyler Wilkinson and you know, he was a country, he is a country boy through and through. And he's like, Hey, you want to come on a Turkey hunt with me? Mm-hmm. So went on a Turkey hunt and the morning that we went out, I, I didn't know what we were doing. I had never hunted anything like that before, mm-hmm. but this Turkey went off its head. And at that moment I realized that you can hike through the woods, you can ski through the woods, you can go camping on uh, you know, a luxurious getaway, but hunting prevents you from passively observing your environment. It is actively using your eyes, using your ears, using your, your sense of smell to identify what animals are in the area. And it became something that's now a huge part of my life. So it kind of heightens the presence of now, like the present moment. Yeah. Yeah. When you're out there in the woods and you're pursuing game, you have to be so self-aware. You Mm -hmm. have to track every footstep. You have to make sure that you're as quiet as possible. But not only that, you have to analyze everything that's around you. And by the time you come out of the woods, you're mentally exhausted. Mm. But throughout that process, I think that it's very growth inspiring, right? Because you have to become aware of yourself, but you also have to become aware of things that you might not necessarily always pay attention to. Mm which is a very valuable skill for life, especially with social media and yeah. all of this incredible stimulation that's around us at any given point. Yeah. We're not quiet. We're not observant. We don't notice mm-hmm. the little things. We go from our house to our car, to our job, yeah. to the gym. And we we kind of have this like ambient noise or white noise that persists in our mind where we never give it a break, but it's never heightened to the point where it's fully engaged perhaps and it sounds like hunting does that i think for for many of us exercise can do that you know when we're really quote unquote in the zone going back because you, you you had so many points to your life story that i was like man there's a lot of questions to ask one one being the slush puppies but we're gonna put that to the side <laughs> i just love the name at any point when you were living this very nomadic kind of fly by the seat of your pants type of life did you ever think or consider hey maybe i'll go back towards my parents or get any help from them if you were struggling with a job or money or any of that or was that not an option or were you more just an independent soul and hey i don't want to you know go back to to mom's house type deal yeah so my parents have always been very helpful to me when i needed it but to a point right my father came from a very poor family of five he paid his way through college. He got into a very prestigious business school and made his way, right? And I think that as a result of that, he felt the need to test me, which I think is good for parents to do to their kids. If you give your kids everything in life, then they're always going to come back to you for more, right? And they're never going to learn any hard lessons. And so I think that there was a good balance in that. Now, when I was living this nomadic lifestyle, I was very focused on being that, you know, being that independent person that didn't need any help from anybody else. Mm -hmm. And, and I think my parents really sort of lived vicariously through me in, in that experience, right? Because every day I would wake up and when you're traveling in a foreign land where you don't speak the language, every single moment is an opportunity to learn something or to be on edge, right? Yeah. Because you can't rely on that structure or that routine or your routes to go wherever you need to go that we so heavily rely on when we're in one place. Mm-hmm. So when I was there, I definitely 
did begin to struggle at the end with the thought of not having any security and not having any savings. I would talk to my friends and they'd be like, oh man, I just got stock in this company yeah. that I'm working for. I just bought my first house. I'm getting married. We're expecting a child. And I'm sitting there on my motorcycle like, where do I score hash for the day? You know, yeah, and it's like yeah. there are the grass is always greener. And, you know, I'm, I, I would I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I look back on those memories and and think, man, I could be, you know, in in Indonesia right now or mm-hmm. in Africa doing those things. But I think that there's seasons for everything. Right. And so that and I find that and I do this very much myself. We idealize the past or, you know, maybe individuals we once knew or, you know, ex relationships we once had. And w- if we really went back and lived those things, we'd realize they weren't they aren't as rosy as we remember them, yeah. you know. So, you know, the, the memories were maybe very enriching and soul fulfilling uh, at the time. But there is things that you don't have that you do today. Right. And maybe the, the, the love and support of your family, the comforts and secure or uh, consistency that you have in your life that, you you know, you don't regret. Um, so I, I get what you're saying, though. There is that. uh that allure of, of the, uh, the nostalgia that, that comes to your mind. Yeah, absolutely. One, uh, thing I wanted to ask you, cause this is kind of like a m- minor debate we had on our last run was this idea of conveniences and, and like the wilderness. So, you know, what is your argument or advocation? I should say more so that, uh, for getting out in the wilderness in a world where we do have so many, uh, you know, creature comforts and, and conveniences at our disposal. Look, there are more people in the world than ever today. And life will not always be as comfortable as it is now. We go through cycles in humanity. Yeah. And right now we're at the most prosperous time in, in human history. And I think it's more important than ever for people to get out into environments of discomfort to see what they're made of. Mm -hmm. If they don't do that, then when adversity strikes, they will be unprepared and they will be unable to defend themselves, provide for themselves and feel comfortable when there is no comfort. Yeah. And so that's a big part of the reason that I get out in the woods is you know for the peace and the solace but also for the challenge because there mm-hmm. really is no there's no cheating the mountain is is a common saying yeah I, I think it gives you a different sense of pride when you went and made the kill and you uh what is it called dressed uh give me the term field dressed yeah the right you term feel, yeah there, there you, you go, there I go. Yeah. <laughs> when you field dress the animal and you know it, it's meat that you had to earn the hard way, as you pointed out. And when your your daughter is eating it, or your wife's eating it, you're having a meal together. You're, you know, as you're cooking the meal and preparing it, you can reflect on what you had to do. You know, to have that, rather than as you know, Cameron Haynes says, paying the hitman. You know, the grocery store to go mm-hmm. to go get your meat. Uh, and another thing I think about too is the the idea of self sufficiency is a skill set that you know you don't need to go out and be a supreme hunter you don't really even need to hunt at all but i think having some manner of social self-sufficiency having these different practices implemented into your life whether it is you know baking sourdough uh, Mm -hmm. because we saw during the pandemic when the grocery store runs out of eggs or the grocery store runs out of meat or you know you're out of power in your house do you have the skills to start a fire or, you know, to, to, to create some sense of heat if your heating system goes down and, you know, the grid's down or something like that? You don't have to be a doomsday prepper, but having some level of, hey, if things go awry, you know, I'm able to adapt and take care of my family nonetheless. Mm-hmm. Um, with that in mind, where would you say that people should get started? So I kind of asked you this a little bit earlier. You know, I said that, you know, baking sourdough bread, I think, is where I want to start with elements of homesteading or self-sufficiency in my own life in suburbia. Where would you say people should kind of start to implement some of these either outdoor skills or getting themselves out into the wilderness? Well, first, I would say the best way to learn is the Internet. 
there are more resources than ever before mm-hmm. and there are more people online that you can then that you can connect with that will teach you these things and you can also identify farmers in your local area it may not be within 10 miles it may not be within 20 miles but likely it will be within a 50 mile drive uh where you can go and get fresh eggs, you can get raw milk, you can get beef, and you can learn from these people and establish relationships with them and learn about how they live their lives if that's something that you're interested in. But I would also recommend just going and taking a walk in the woods and not feeling like you need to have tons of gear to be able to do it, right? It's important to have basic necessities like clean water and something to start a fire, Mm -hmm. but you don't need the top of the line Alpine gear to go take a a walk in the woods. As long as you have safely identified where you're planning to go and where you plan to return to, I think that's really important. And also doing it alone. I feel like Mm. in today's world, people are scared of being alone. And it's one of the most valuable things that you can do for yourself in this life is to become comfortable with who you are and the thoughts in your head. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I think having that internal dialogue and comfortability with that dialogue um, and, and exactly that actually a dialogue rather than a monologue, because I think Having the perspective of it as a dialogue means you can kind of weigh maybe both your conscious and unconscious or your desires and your emotions versus maybe your rational decision making in your mind and have that back and forth and be able to weigh pros and cons and uh, enact that uh, higher level of consciousness versus monologue is maybe just thinking the thoughts versus uh, actually deciphering the thoughts and and going a little bit deeper perhaps Mm -hmm. um for the people that are scared to start by themselves could you elaborate more so you know are they maybe going on a short hike by themselves rather than let's say like a full you know day camping by themselves or or what would you what would you say with that or should they look to find someone maybe in their community to start with yeah i would say start small right take a day hike first and figure out a spot that you know looks like a good spot to camp Mm -hmm. uh work your way up it's going to be scary i what tools not to catch up what tools do you have for safety knife do you carry a firearm depending on where you're going or yeah it depends on where i'm going but for areas where i've identified a lot of cat sign or bear scat Mm. i'm definitely going to take a firearm just because for me personally, now my life has evolved to the, to the point where I can't just go out and die in the woods. No, yeah. I have a family and, you know, I think that they would be pretty upset if that happened. And you I hope. think they'd be pretty <laughs> upset if I didn't have the means to defend myself if it came to that. Mm-hmm. I've only had one pretty serious encounter with a bear uh, where he false charged me up to about 20 yards. Um but other than that, you know, I've spent... What'd you do in that situation? Uh, pretty much shit my pants. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I'd like to say that I was full draw, but it happened so quickly. And, you know, he just came out of this tree, out of this sort of dark timber. And, you know, I was yeah kind of at a loss. I mean, I, I don't know what would have happened, but thankfully it didn't. He just slowly didn't. walked yeah, he away? Just, no, he just ran straight and then just pivoted off at like 20 yards man so yeah. yeah i'm scared with uh my my race you know big horn there's definitely like you know grizzlies out there and um i think they have potential for mountain lions too but i know for sure this last year i remember seeing some people on their story you know as they were running the race you know, and i'm just like you know uh it, it almost makes me not want to run the race you know i'm just i'm just <laughs> scared of the encounter even then i know it's like hey there's going to be a lot of you out there. Uh, yeah, they're not going to want to go towards the trail, but I just, uh, it irks me, man. It irks me. Yeah. So chances are in the woods, you're, you're really not going to have serious encounters with game because one, they're probably more scared of you than mm-hmm. you are of them. And if you do, it's a very rare occurrence and, you know, you have to do your research on, yeah. you know, what what animals are out there and what to do in the event of 
a close encounter, but mm-hmm. chances are you're really not going to have a close encounter. Hell, I go looking for them in the woods mm-hmm. and, you know, it's hard to find, hard to find. So yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, it's, there is more magic in the woods than there is fear, I think. And yeah. once you can get past, uh, the, the whistling of the wind and your own mind, then it becomes a truly memorable experience that can be relished over and over. One uh, thing that I thought was very, well, it was, it was kind of like the, at least one of the parts of us meeting was, uh, and I don't know if you still do it as regularly. I know you make it, but baking sourdough and meeting new people and bringing them a loaf. Yeah. I thought that was very a very fascinating way to make a first impression. I know you... Uh, did you make like a, a, was it like a photo album with the pictures, a wall of it or something like that? But I, I think it's a very one, as we talked about when we were eating earlier today, making new connections and relationships, leveraging Instagram, finding, I thought about it earlier today, how cliche it's become, but the, the idea of like-minded individuals, it's not that the term isn't valuable. It's just almost overstated as like a buzzword at this point. But finding like-minded individuals, other people that are passionate about similar things, that are just passionate about life in general, and trying to go out of your way to meet those people, I think is a is a crucial step. And you never know what one relationship, one conversation, what run together will lead to. So what was the genesis of why you started not just baking the bread, but saying, hey, I want to start bringing this to people when I meet them? Yeah, so baking bread, it's an activity that involves time and effort and love Mm -hmm. really to, to make a solid loaf of sourdough. You have to be attentive to the steps and the process. And it does take, you know, quite, quite a bit of time to be able to do it. You have to maintain it. And I saw that as a great opportunity to give an intangible gift to others, right? Because you can buy a book for somebody or, you know, you could buy something very expensive for somebody, but for me, giving that loaf of bread symbolized that I wanted to give of my time, which is the most mm. valuable resource in this life. Yeah. And that resonated with a lot of people. I think now I I have so many hobbies that it's it, it all comes down to time management. And now getting into the holiday season, I'm definitely going to be making more yeah, bread. Where, where to, yeah, where's bread? your loaf? Right? <laughs> yeah, it's why it's, it's uh, why I wanted to meet today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, for for me, it's like I'm either gonna give meat or bread mm-hmm. for the holidays because I just see those as symbols of the time that I've spent and and how much I value that person that mm-hmm. I would sacrifice, you know, three, five, eight hours to make something by hand for them. And I just think it's, it's amazing to see all of these photos of people yeah. that I've given loaves to and the relationships that have then been established as a result of those loaves given loaves of love. <laughs> yeah. Loaves of love. It's a, you know, b- breaking bread. Yeah. It, it, there's a huge metaphor for that. Yeah, and And I yeah. truly, I truly believe that by sharing that time with somebody else Mm -hmm. that you show that you value them as people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As you've gotten more and more into hunting, I know this year you've been very active with it. What are your long-term visions for uh, homesteading or getting land? I know both of us have this aspiration for having more land and, and maybe developing like a little mini farm and building from there. So what are your, what are your current goals for that? Yeah, I think long-term I would love to have a property where I can bring people out and run workshops, teaching them about sustainable gardening, teaching them about the process of the pause on that. Yeah. You were the one that told me about dry Creek Wrangler school, right? I don't think so. No. Do you no. know what it is? No. Oh my God! Who told me about this thing? You've probably seen, you've probably seen the real. There's this guy up in uh, ah, uh, I think it's Montana, 
and it's this older gentleman. You've probably seen him on a reel where he was talking about like young men and this and that because he kind of went viral for that. Oh, yeah. But I've I found the YouTube. Yeah, you've probably seen he's like smoking a cigar. Yeah. yeah, that guy. So I never knew who he was either. I stumbled upon his YouTube a few, um, I guess it's a few months at this point ago. And a lot of it is, you know, sit down 12 to 20 minute videos of him just rambling on advice either to young men or uh, people going through hard times experiencing loneliness all that stuff really insightful guy he kind of, you might look at him and go he you know maybe knows some stuff about you know uh, horses and, and farming and this and that but he really i mean he has a wide vocabulary he's very intelligent he's read all the classics he's a smart man and uh, it's funny because I could have sworn I told one guy about it. I was like, didn't you tell me? He's like, no, no, I've never heard of that. And then I was like, oh, it was Austin. And then now I mentioned it to you and you don't know who he is. I mean, I know who he is. The okay. guy, yeah, he's lived a lot of life. You can tell yeah. just by looking into his eyes. It just and, reminded me when you yeah. said that like bringing people out because he, uh, I think he, what's it? He, he doesn't like, it's not an equestrian school, but it's more, uh, it's a wrangling school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's called dry creek wrangling school. So, uh, so he brings out people and stuff like that, but carry on, sorry. But yeah, I think long-term we would love to have land where we can become as self-sustainable as possible, Yeah, where we can feel peace and, and ownership for what we have and be good stewards of that land. And I'd love to be able to teach people about hunting that might not necessarily know about it, um, teach them the process of field to table and uh, run workshops geared towards mainly teaching the younger generation about how to get into hunting, fishing, mm -hmm. and, and homesteading. You know who I got to connect you with as soon as we finish this? Is a, do you know who Zachary Hansen is? I had him on my podcast a few weeks ago. No, the name rings a bell though. Probably maybe you saw him on my podcast, but he he, he just like started an Instagram less than a year ago. Um, but he has this book called Turning Feral. He was like, in, well, he's still in AI technology and in that field. He worked for like Capital One and IBM and all of that. But he uh, a couple of years ago moved to basically the middle of nowhere, Atlanta, Idaho. And he's like 90 miles in this like long road is where his house is at. And uh, so he's kind of lived this out in the sticks, off the grid type lifestyle. And I think he'd be a great resource to connect you with. Not that you want to go to that extent, but as far as I mean, he's a big like trapper more mm -hmm. than like hunting. And um, I, I know you guys would, would hit it off. But I think he'd love to meet another guy that. Um, is interested in the same thing and you guys could could bounce back and forth with that in mind because this is another thing we talked about on our last run what limits are you interested in or what limits do you have for yourself as far as where you'll go so i know one thing we talked about was i was like hey i want to live you know away from society a decent bit but still be close enough to some amount of conveniences i like to be an hour close to a costco i'd like to still get Amazon packages to my door, right? I I couldn't live the life that Zach does, you know, three hours to the closest like legit city. You know, mm -hmm. I I couldn't live in a community of eighty people. It's just a little too tight for me. What are the parameters that you think of when you think of uh, your future or idealized property? So. I personally don't have any self-imposed limits in my life for what the future holds. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm obviously tied to the wishes of my of my wife <laughs> yes, and what's yes. going to happy make her life, feel happy life, comfortable, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we should all be happy together. Exactly. Right? Yeah. However, I think that there is something great about the infinite space right the the space that or the at least perceived infinity of space around you where you can step out of your door and you don't hear anything yeah i think that that is something that you know i i envision tranquil yeah i envision yeah. as as a goal for me is when i step out of my house i don't even hear the sound of a distant train all i hear is the whistling of the trees and the birds chirping mm -hmm. i think that that is something that's very important to me uh ideally by a source of water where we can hear the water and where i can walk for 
potentially a whole day and not come across another house, I think would be something fantastic. Now, it is nice to be able to go into town and have the comforts of a, a nice meal that you shop. haven't cooked yeah. for yourself or yeah, for a, a nice coffee shop or you know the amenities of society, right? There's mm -hmm. a reason why people pay taxes because they love their roads. They love or their... Or because they'll put you in jail. Or because yeah. they'll put you in jail, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And they just keep going up every yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, for some reason they do. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's... Uh, for me, it's just that ownership of my own place where I can go to, where I can have protection yeah. for myself and my family and my loved ones. I like how you described it via senses, not via like qualities versus quantities, because that's something I've thought about too when I've either thought of it mentally or written it down. Like, what do I want my future to look like? What do I want you know, my wife and I's next house to look like. And that's what I've generally done is, you know, what does it smell like? What is, you know, what is my breakfast like in this future house? Or what am I doing? What are the walls painted? Like what color? And I think uh, that really can help give you a better idea of what you truly want, you know, and, and also give you a little bit of the steps to get it. Um, yeah, I think it's just an enlightening process to go through it that way. Uh, and I think you realize you can do a lot more with less than, you know, trying to say, oh, I want, you know, X size house or I want it to be here or there. Yeah, because that's all bullshit. Yeah. It's, you can, I mean, trust me, I bought a lot of stuff in my life mm -hmm. and it's made me happy to a point, mm -hmm. but by focusing on, the senses right of yeah. how these things will truly make you feel and things that are uh they don't depend on you right yeah. those birds are going to be there if you're not there mm -hmm. that stream's going to be there and there is beauty in being able to exist among that because you know that there is permanence in that as yeah. opposed to buying a house or a car you know that's only going to make you feel a sense of temporary pleasure yeah what well, i remember what i was where my brain was trying to go it was that i think of that too when it comes to what do i want my future life to look like I the older I've gotten the less and less I've looked to what I want the car or the house or anything material like you said because that has have a lot of temperance to it but more so I think of like the habits the relationships the routines that I want to have you know and it is as simple as I want to wake up and brew a beautiful cup of coffee. I want to kiss my wife, walk my dogs out, um, you know, eventually see my children in the morning, play with them. I want to eat whole foods. I want to exercise every day. I might want to take a dip in a cold bath, you know. These are the kind of wellness things that I think will not only take care of my health uh, mentally, physically, emotionally, and, and, and enrich me overall. Um, Taking that and turn it to uh, another topic I want to ask you about is, uh, you know, parenthood. You bring your daughter a lot with you um, to all these hunts and trips. And as far as parenting overall, I want to ask, because we touched on a little bit about your parents, what kind of father was your father and how has that shaped you uh, into the father you are today? Yeah, so I think that this is the first generation of fathers that spends time with their kids because they realize that that's the most valuable thing that you can give to them. Whereas our fathers saw the best way to invest into their kids is by making enough money to give them everything that they want. And I'm not going to say that it's right or wrong to do that. Um, my dad worked his ass off for our family to give us all of the things that he thought that he didn't get growing up. It's right? funny. Our, I think our dads are very similar, not just in the work ethic, but my dad also came from a family of five, also grew up very poor without a dad in his house. And I think he carried that into how he raised us in the same attitude of just wanting to say, hey, my soul goal and purpose and function in this family is to provide. Absolutely. And I mean... There 
you cannot knock somebody like that that's got a chip on their shoulder yeah. that just wants to have a better life and give their kids all of the opportunities that they never had. But for me, because I didn't get to spend enough time with my dad, mm -hmm. all I want to do is hang out with my kid, Yeah. right? All I want to do is share tangible experiences with her that are going to serve her for the rest of her life. And so... I spend so much time taking my daughter out on these high alpine lake trips to go catch trout or taking her on deer hunts with me to go track deer or whatever, building forts in the woods, right? Because I see that time is the most valuable commodity we have and 75% mm -hmm. of the time that we spend with our kids is from the time that they're born until the th time that they're 12. And then it gets less as it goes on until they go and live their own lives. And so I want to relish every second that I have with my daughter by giving her my time. Mm -hmm. What kind of values or principles, if there are some select ones that you've thought of, do you hope to imprint on your daughter? A lot of people I've talked to and asked a similar question have had sons. So I wonder how you think of this uh, from the point of raising a daughter uh, in this modern day. Yeah, so my wife has got the femininity side covered. I don't have much experience <laughs> with... You're not the to, makeup guy. I'm not the no. makeup guy. <laughs> I have done my best to learn Taylor Swift lyrics. Yeah. It's and, too late for you. <laughs> you know, I, and and I let my wife dress me for the most mm -hmm. part. Great stylist, by the way. Yeah. But the things that I want to teach my daughter are self resilience, virtue, <clears throat> the the power of a good work ethic, and embracing nature. I think mm. that that is so far removed from kids today yeah. that aren't taught any of these things in school. So when you're at a restaurant, you don't just hand her an iPad? Absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not. Actually, uh, Suri, my daughter, her godfather has been asking for years to get Suri an iPad. And it's like... <laughs> I think Maddie and I, uh, we, we said whenever we have a kid, we don't want them to know what an iPad is until they're like 12, you know? <laughs> I mean, so, so they're, you know... There's practical uses. It's not there to be are all there negative. are. That's the thing. It's like it would be hypocritical for me to say to my daughter, "Oh, well, social media is bad because we're building a business with yeah. social media." Her and I together. Mm -hmm. You know, she 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 has just as much much of a part to play in this as I do, and so it would be hypocritical for me to say that it's wrong. But I think that it's important for kids to know that these things are tools, just like a hammer that can mm -hmm. be used to bash somebody's brain in or build a house, right? It's how you use these tools. They can be used to waste your life and waste your time and absorb mm -hmm. all of this negative information that skews your worldview or turns you into an incredibly cynical person, or it can be used to connect us to mm. create something beautiful or go on runs or push ourselves or use each other as motivation rather than, you know, a comparative standard for mm -hmm. what success looks like. So, yeah, I mean, the the things that I'm trying to teach my daughter ultimately boil down to positive self-resiliency and a sound a sound mind focused on like empowering herself you know yeah. i i see so many young people today girls boys that think that they're not successful in life unless they've got a million followers on youtube or yeah. look like you know a porcelain doll and it's just not true there are so it's, many it's yeah i'm cutting you off but that point i thought it was pretty interesting it is a weird thing nowadays where even when you acknowledge oh she photoshops her photos or oh it's fake even with the acknowledgement there's still like the implicit emotional experience i think we get and definitely children get from social media that still has an underlying effect on how they view themselves in the world yeah absolutely it's yeah. i mean take the the bullying atmosphere that we had in 
you know, our childhood growing up where you'd get whispered about in the halls or notes would be passed around and then take that to a digital format. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's not something that I would want to be involved in. I got more of the digital side of it because by the time Facebook and Instagram were occurring, I was just entering middle school. Yeah. Yes. I'm that young. Um, but it, it's definitely an interesting world. It, it, it wrecks you more emotionally than physically, you know, and in some more than others. Luckily, I was, I think, a bit more resilient through it. But not everyone is that way. Not everyone has that individualism or introspection um, or has the tools or has been raised, you know, to, to handle that. Um, but that's the key, right? You know, that's the key. If you're raised to handle adversity, difficult things and you're confident in yourself. Knowing your identity. You're confident yeah, yeah. in knowing that you can do hard things. The words of people that, you know, say, you know, the, these unfounded words from people, they hurt less. Yeah. Right? And so for me, I love my kid more than anything, but I'm not going to give her a free handout and I'm not going to coddle her, right? Mm. When we kill a deer and I've got the deer on my back and she wants to be on my shoulders walking through tall reeds, I'll make a way for her, but she's got to walk that path too, mm -hmm. right? Because we've all got burdens and, you know, every and everybody has to get through it. Yeah. And someday I won't be here for her. And, you know, I want her to be able to know that she can stand on her own two legs yeah. and get through it. To wrap things up, I want to ask about this 100-mile race you uh, signed up for. So I'm going to ask you the question that so many people have asked me lately. Why did you sign up for a 100-mile race? Because I like doing hard stuff. I mm -hmm. think that we... What do you think is the underlying reason for wanting to do hard stuff? doesn't have to be one answer, but... Because because it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a yeah. garden in a than a gardener in a war. You know, it's yeah. it's if you do hard stuff daily, then when actual hard stuff comes to your door, it's not as difficult to mm. to attain. I think I feel like for me, it gives me a bit of a uh, reset and point of like relation, you know, and, and relativity. I guess you know, like. It does give me that sense of, hey, I've overcome this. I can I can handle this petty, uh, you know, occurrence. But it also gives me a, like, you know, like people talk about that uh, Masogi thing a lot, you know, and it gives it gives you a, a circumstance of just or point of reflection of. Uh, yeah, it, it, it goes back to the, the wilderness thing. It, it gives you that isolated experience that you can't get unless it is extremely difficult you know what i mean so it gives you a memory that is kind of seared into your mind differently an experience that has to be paid for not necessarily with blood although sometimes it comes with yeah. with the cause in these races but it gives you a memory that was a uh, hard-earned hard-fought and uh, I mean, it's it's similar to even when I wasn't racing, but the experience at Leadville with Joey, you know, that is a permanent memory. It's not just another Saturday that is going to be a race for my memory. It's, you know, it's it has a sense of permanence. I think that's what these races do, too. Yeah, absolutely. For me, I, I remember the first time I did a marathon. I was scared of doing the marathon. Yeah. Uh, it was a mental block in my mind, right? The first time I hopped into a frozen lake, you know, it, it was a, a, a mental blocker in my mind. And you do these things and this veil of illusion of fear is gone, right? And so 100 miles to me is another obstacle that I need to overcome. I think that it's something that sets me on the this further path to greatness of self-actualization and figuring out who I am and what I'm made of. Mm -hmm. And there are also these auxiliary benefits. People around you, they are inspired by these actions. Yeah. They they yeah. has a trickle down effect. Yeah, it does. It inspires other people and for me everything that I do, uh, it ultimately comes down to this legacy of 
of who I am, who my daughter can look up to and who she can become. I hope that she beats me in every single thing that I do, Mm -hmm. you know, because it's going to make her into a strong woman. And that's my job on this earth is to be a good father, be a good husband and, you know, spread my knowledge to the world so that we can create a better world so other people can be better people yeah can be better fathers be better mothers man what, what a way to end it what a way to yeah. end it well Austin, i really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation we'll obviously do it again real soon and maybe i'll come up towards your way maybe we'll go on a hunt maybe we'll bake bread together <laughs> and then break bread bake it then break it yeah um uh, but uh, where can people find you especially you know lately you've, you've been posting a lot more content and it started to take off so where can people uh, find the work that you're doing yeah you can find me at wilderness underscore father uh across all channels youtube instagram tiktok uh i'm everywhere on tiktok yeah yeah Just followed it <laughs> yeah no i love it i you know it tiktok is is a really interesting place but yeah. uh you know, the more people that can learn about the outdoors, yeah. the better. And that's my life mission is to spread awareness of the power of the woods and inspire parents to teach their kids about it and carry on this this great tradition that is a part of our primal heritage. Yeah. Well, perfect. Give Austin a follow. Share the podcast if you enjoyed it. Follow for more stuff to come. And we'll catch you guys in the next one.